Hey, welcome to BJJ Mental Models, episode 133. I'm Steve Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent jiu-jitsu approach. And today, here to explore a topic that I think everyone knows I'm very passionate about, Ms. Erin Hurley. Erin, how are you doing? I'm great. How are you? I am also doing good. And as I was saying earlier, before we got on the recording, it is selfishly always nice to record with people in the same time zone as me. It just makes my life so much easier. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. West Coast. <laughs> yeah, let's do this. Let's do this. So, I mean, you came onto my radar for the same reason you probably came onto a lot of people's radar, which is your foundation, Submit mm -hmm. the Stigma. So I'd love for you to maybe take a moment for those of you not familiar with your work to maybe just talk about your story and Submit the Stigma and what your passions are. Yeah. So I am a jiu-jitsu black belt currently training MMA. And I started Submit the Stigma, which is spelled out as a hashtag, all one word. Because in the beginning, it was just meant to be a mental health awareness campaign. In 2015, I lost my dad to suicide. And having always been this transparent person, I've had a, a public blog since I was a white belt. I've always talked about those things. And on my Instagram, if anyone follows me, I'm really, really transparent. And so I felt that there was a need to speak about it. You know, like, why am I going to speak about every aspect of my life except for this monumental moment? So when my dad died, we ended up making a GoFundMe page for the National Alliance on Mental Illness, which is a national American charity that has chapters in every single state. And I saw it as a way that my dad would have used, you know, mental health resources because he was not comfortable talking about therapy or talking about his, his feelings and all these issues that obviously were going on. And so I found that through my jujitsu journey, which is what we kind of call it, I started in 2009. And since then, it was sort of synonymous with my journey with mental health and kind of figuring out why am I like this? There's so many times that we can go through life and go, okay, whatever, it's the other person. Oh, that's because, you know, this stressed me out. That's the way I acted that way, blaming other people. But when you get on the mat, you know, you, there's no lies. You cannot fake anything. You can't fake the fact that you a belt level. You can't fake being intelligent or smart or quick or any of those things. You just are what you are. You come as you are and you put yourself in bad positions every single day and you work on how to get out of them. And that was what I did with my mental health. And so Submit the Stigma is a nonprofit, full 501c3 nonprofit in the US. And we've done seminars and some online interactions to build a community that minimal minimizes the stigma of mental health. I don't say eliminates, you know, there always will be, but in the mental health community, it's overlapping in the jujitsu community. And I wanted that to bond because for me, it was such a uh, paired journey. So for me, I talk about it. And I think that there's more than just professional help. Of course, I always say, always get professional help. Like I'm not a professional mental health professional. A lot of the people that are part of Submit the Stigma aren't, but they just find solace in finding that they're not alone. And that was the idea. So when I first started it, it was at the Nogi Pans in 2015. And I got on the podium and I, I held the sign and I gave it to other people to hold the sign. Nogi World, I was actually it was 2016. And then 2016 Nogi Worlds, I was able to, you know, hold a sign and stuff. So it was really important for me to just sort of spread this message that, hey, this is present. This is common. And the things that we are able to do in jujitsu is very, very synonymous with the journey of mental health. So just destigmatizing mental health in the jiu-jitsu community. And I want to bring it into the MMA community soon and eventually try to bring jiu-jitsu as a means of mental health and wellness to the psychologists and psychiatrists in my area. So I love the absolute targeting that you've got going on here where you're specifically saying that the purpose of this initiative is, I mean, it's not to solve every, everyone's mental health problems mm -hmm. because that's outside of the scope of our skill set here, but it's to drive awareness and normalize the practice of seeking help for mental health. Because I find that that is where often the challenge is when it comes to mental health. There seems to be this resistance to help to the process of asking. I mean, it's interesting because I know a lot of people who, you know, training in jujitsu, right? You're going to get injuries here and there. I know people who are more than happy to go to a doctor if they get a broken bone or go to a physiotherapist if they're rehabbing, but they have this incredible resistance 
to just talking to a therapist or or seeking help, right? There is some sort of, I mean, I guess you, you said it best, there is a stigma around it. Now, where that stigma exactly comes from, I don't really understand. But mm-hmm. my my guess would be that part of it is, you know, we we don't look at the brain as just another organ, which is what all it is, right? The brain is another piece of our body. It's another organ. Right. But we look at the brain as this other thing that is like detached from our body, which is just not true. The brain is part of the body. And so I think what a lot of the time people feel is, well, if there's something wrong with my body, that's like the car breaking down, you fix it. But if there's something wrong with my brain, that must mean there's something wrong with myself. Right. Um, that's that's maybe my theory in terms of why people are so hesitant to seek mental health. I like that, yeah. You know, when I was growing up, I, I had this idea that my thoughts are me. The things that I think are me. They are me, they are the self, they are my identity, my ego, my thoughts, everything. And so when my thoughts were telling me negative things, I believed them. And then it wasn't until I became, you know, more of an adult, I actually read into a little bit of Buddhism. Like your thoughts are not you is basically what I learned. And the fact that you have the ability to control your thoughts with, you know, it takes a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. And literally no one else can help you because it's just you and your thoughts. But separating the self with the thoughts was a huge thing for me to be able to treat myself because I'm not saying that I'm bad. I'm a bad apple. I, you know, I'm depressed. No, I just have depression. Oh, I'm an anxious mess. No, I have anxiety. So just because I have anxiety, right? I make this joke with people that I'm not fat. I just have fat. (laughs) That's actually a great point. It, It is, right? So it's like, it's not my identity. It's just a situation, a phase, something that I actually can control. Now, that's a lot to do on your own. And that's why professional help is so important because we have a million things. Like you say you want to do your hair. You're like, how do I do my hair today? You know, or you're like, all right, well, I'm going to wrap my hands with this uh, wrap so I can go to training. And then you're like, am I doing it wrong? Should I do it? another? There's so many different ways to do things. And it just helps when you have someone else in there to guide you with your thoughts. And so that's why professional help is so important. But I really like the fact that you said self, the idea of self in the brain because if you're right is who you are as a person is held within this organ and it's very hard to differentiate yeah it's great that you actually brought up things like buddhism and mindfulness practice i mean i remember when i discovered this whole area of practice you know for a long time i think i didn't really take it seriously. I thought it was this like new age hippy dippy thing. You know, when I was reading about it, I thought like, oh, you know, I'm not sure I want to get into this, right? Like I don't want to get indoctrinated by a bunch of yogis. And, indoctrinated, right? Yeah. And like suddenly I'm in this like religious cult. I don't want that. Exactly. <laughs> You're like, I have a cult. I have jujitsu. It's a cult already. I'm good. Yeah. Because <laughs> that's what I thought mindfulness was, right? Mm-hmm. But I remember my first exposure to it was through Eckhart Tolle, who takes a very non-religious approach to mindfulness. And the big breakthrough to me, well, there were many big breakthroughs, but one of them, which you already brought up, was the understanding that the mind is not the self. Because I think when we grow up as, at least when I grew up as a child, I had this perception that like there's two parts of me. There's my mind, which is me, and then there's the body. And like my brain is the, is, you know, the driver and the body is the car. That's the way I kind of thought of it. But what I realize now after studying this stuff and, and practicing mindfulness is that that is totally not true. There's actually kind of two parts to you. There is your body, which includes your brain, and then there is you. And those two things are not necessarily the same, right? You are not your body. You are not your brain. And that's the thing that I didn't understand. I always knew that I was not my body. But what I did not understand is that I was also not my brain. I thought my brain was was me. I thought like there was a little mini yes. Steve who lived up yes. in there. Yes, yes. But yes. I mean, what we know now is we study the brain is that like the brain and the brain is just another organ. It's a super duper cool, fancy organ that we frankly, have trouble understanding because it's so complex, but it is just another organ, right? Things like diet and, um, you know, exercise, they can affect your brain just as much as they do your body. The brain is just an organ, but yourself is something else, right? The sense of self you have is separate from the brain and the body. And 
and and the process of learning to create that space between yourself and your body and detach that's the key to presence and mindfulness in that whole practice and just i'll pass the mic back to you in a second but the one thing that actually kind of blew my mind is first of all as i started practicing mindfulness i realized that okay this actually legitimately works it's not some crazy religious thing i'm not going to get like i'm not going to wind up selling all my possessions and like moving into a van or anything but what also surprised me is that now they're starting to understand there was actually a significantly growing body of research that actually demonstrates that scientifically mindfulness is good for you. So that that practice, like having a practice is incredibly helpful for mental health. At least that, that is what I have found. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. With that said, though, I'd be curious to get your thoughts. Well, I feel like what you were talking about is like the feelings versus the needs. And so separating the self, there are times when we, we talk about this word, I don't know who we are, I'm just going to say we is like grounded, feeling more grounded. So when you get and we always say like, get out of your own head, get out of your own head. And I think there is validity to that because you need to get out of your feelings and your emotions and in all these sub, all of your consciousness right? The consciousness. And sometimes it helps to just feed the body, right? So when we talk about self-care, which is obviously a sort of a trigger word nowadays for influencers, and they're like, oh no, self-care, <laughs> taking a bath. And and uh, it doesn't really get the full idea of what self-care is. And self-care is just stepping out of your consciousness and saying, what does my body really need right now? What's going to help my body function better. Self-care is making sure that you drink water, which for me is like a full-time job. Like if I'm not training, especially it's very hard. I don't get thirsty, but I know that water is good for the body. It's good for the mind. It's good for the skin. It's good for everything. It's going to make me feel better. Food, whether I quote unquote feel like eating or not, I need to eat. I'm going to go to training. I need sustenance. I need fuel. So the idea of your feelings versus your needs, when I have anxiety, a lot of the times, you know, I've been diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder. And what that means is I don't have to have a rhyme or reason to be anxious. That's pretty much what it is. So when I'm able to recognize that, it helps me to just focus on the physical symptoms. Okay, what if I just, okay, if I'm feeling a little bit fatigued because of my mind is going crazy, I'm going to sit down. I'm going to eat. I'm going to make sure I eat. I'm going to make sure that I drink. I'm going to make sure that all of my needs, my physical needs are met. And obviously being an MMA fighter and being a, you know, jujitsu competitor, there are a lot more physical needs because I'm putting my body through so much, but you can't forget about the mind and fighting and training. All of those things require so much mental fortitude. And what I mean by that is, is kind of talking back to yourself because as you do things, especially when your muscles start getting tired, You know, your central nervous system is constantly messaging the muscles and and communicating. And often the brain will not allow the muscles to be used to their full potential because the brain is like, whoa, 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 guys, like an overprotector, overprotective mom. That's like, I don't know. It's it's stopping 30 minutes yet. You can't go swimming. You just ate a hot dog, sweetie. That's kind of what our brain tells us. And especially if you are just even just working out, like if I have a barbell, it's me and a barbell, me trying to lift this heavy thing. If I psych myself out, if I start thinking about all the reasons why I might not be able to lift this thing, I'm definitely not going to. But if I focus on the things that my body is capable of and I support myself, like my mind supports my body, I'm going to be able to achieve it. Now, imagine if you're training and someone is punching you in the face or someone is pulling at your arm while you're trying to do things to them. Automatically, these these ideas are going to come in your head and go, oh, man, this guy's going to submit me right now. Oh, man, I'm competing against this guy. And now I'm in their clothes guard. I was in Bia Mosquita's clothes guard. Like that was insane. I, I weathered a storm and I ended up in her clothes guard. This woman has the best clothes guard in all of female jujitsu. And here I am like, oh my God. And I'm in my head and I'm thinking, wow, I'm never going to get out of this, you know? And so there's things that our mind has to recognize. And so I like the idea that we went off of with the self and the thoughts and all those things. But really when it comes down to it, it's the physical needs of our brain, of our anxiety, of our depression. So when I realize that my depression is kicking in, it makes me not want to do stuff. Well, that means that I have to fight myself and say, no, I don't care that you want to sit on the couch all day. You have to go make some food because if you don't have food, you're going to feel like shit. And if you're not able to actually do anything because you don't have food in you, it's just going to go all downhill. So it's kind of like putting yourself in check and and having those, you know, like the car dashboard, having all of those things come on and, and not not ignoring the, the maintenance required light like I do so many times. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I 
I think you're absolutely right that you need to prioritize self-care. And I, I agree that like self-care is more than just like writing in your journal or right. taking a spa day, right? <laughs> self-care is about being honest and open about what you need and making sure that you get it. And that can, that can be physical. It mm-hmm. can be spiritual. It can be mental. It can be mm-hmm. anything, right? And the problem with depression, from my understanding, again, I, I caveat all of this with the, with the statement that I am absolutely not an expert in this field, but we did have some who is. We had Dr. David Lay on the podcast on episode 103 to discuss this specifically. And what he said was that the problem with depression often is that it puts you into a mindset where you don't want to do things, right? Mm -hmm. And by not doing those things, you're denying yourself the self-care that you need to be successful. So it creates this kind of downward spiral. And part of the cognitive behavioral therapy approach that he advocates for is force yourself to do those things. Like you don't want to do them. Of course you don't want to do them. You're depressed, but force yourself to do them because the process of doing those things will make you happier and will bring you out of depression. Like in, in to some degree, you are the result of your actions, right? If, if you are acting depressed, you will become depressed. And similarly, if you're acting happy, you are more likely to eventually move into an area of happiness. Now, You've probably noticed, Aaron, I think I've certainly noticed, I know a lot of my friends have noticed, but it certainly appears that during this pandemic, like most of our community in BJJ has gone fucking crazy, right? Like if we're going to be honest. Oh my God, yeah. And I think a big part of it, when I was talking to David Lay about this, is he was talking about how like, well, from his perspective, a big part of this is because we are all forcing ourselves in the pandemic because of this pandemic, we're having to give up a lot of the things that were making us happy. Mm-hmm. And as a result of that, we're the pandemic, unfortunately, it leads to us acting like depressed people. But I'm hoping that once we to kind of get back to normal, people will kind of get back into the routine that that they were used to. And I'm hoping that as, as things get better and better, hopefully the crazy factor drops down a little bit. But this pandemic has been an interesting experience in a collective depression, I would say. Like, it's going to be a very interesting experience that, like, regardless of what your belief system is, 30 years from now, 40 years from now, when we're at the retirement home, I can sit down with you, Aaron, and I can say... Hey, you remember that one year where everyone was depressed and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about, right? It's a bizarre collective experience. So I, I hope that one thing that has come out of this last year is that it helps, it helps everyone realize that everyone can get depressed. It doesn't mean there's something totally wrong with you specifically. It doesn't mean you're defective. Depression happens to everyone. And in fact, in 2020 and in early 2021, it did happen to everyone. Mm -hmm. So I hope that if there's one positive that comes out of this fucking pandemic, it's that it normalizes the experience of depression and we're not afraid to admit it anymore going forward. Yes. There was a meme actually, and I speak in memes, like my life is memes. So I think that memes are actually a great way for people to not only understand mental health, but to relate to it because it's like, you know, the acronym like TFW, that feeling when... I think that's so awesome. It's just a, it's a way to relate. And like I said with the the stigma, it's a hashtag. It's meant to be shared, meant for connection, community, feeling like you're not alone. So all of those things is like through memes is this collective, oh my gosh, I know that feeling. I know exactly what that feels like. Mm -hmm. So one of them was, you know, some, some person tweeted and they're like, you know, my kids keep telling me that when they're adults, they can't wait because they're going to eat junk food and sit around and watch TV all day and just sleep all the time. And then I had to remind them that that's actually depression. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's that's absolutely true. That's absolutely yeah. true. And so, you know, having dealt with depression, like I've dealt with serious depression and I've dealt with just this lingering. So I take Prozac. I take it's an antidepressant. Most people know about it because it's sort of this, it does have a stigma against it. Um, I think there was that documentary Prozac Nation and I think it changed my life. And it is that stepping stone for me to regulate my emotions because for me, a depression is all about emotion. But even regardless of my emotion, I've noticed that I still suffer from depression symptoms. Now, what I like to always tell people is you don't need a diagnosis and you don't need an actual mental illness to experience the feelings of depression. So I think the way, instead of saying depression of this collective depression, like you said, I think it's best to say the collective grief. And and grief is something that I've dealt with a lot. 
And grief for me is as little as having an expectation and then not having that expectation met. I, that's how sensitive I was as a child. If you told me we were going to go to Disneyland and we didn't, I would grieve that loss of what could have been. And so obviously breakups are really hard. I'm in a long distance relationship. My boyfriend's in Canada, in Niagara Falls. and Good choice. Uh, yep. <laughs> With the border closed, I had to get a whole exemption to go see him. And luckily we've seen each other. But by the time I see him in July, it'll have been another five months that we've gone without each other. So, you know, I know what that's like to be with someone 24 seven for two months straight and then have to say goodbye and go back to whatever life I had here. So in February, when I came back, my mom was moving. Um, I live with my mom. So we're moving. So obviously there's a lot to do when I got here. But since that time, I mean, there was a grieving process. I was crying every day. It's like having this person next to you and they're not there anymore. And then also with the pandemic, it was here I am a nomad. I go on people's couches and I teach seminars all around the world and I compete. And I had just done my first MMA fight, amateur MMA fight in November of 2019. I had plans in my mind that if things went well and if I found enough opponents during am my amateur career that I could potentially turn pro in 2020. Well, obviously that didn't happen. I stopped training completely. So at first it was, okay, the gym's going to close for two weeks to mellow the curve, right? To, to help mitigate, I guess, all the new cases we didn't even know about. And... From that time, it was like, okay, so now I'm going to mourn the loss of my training because, you know, trying to see if, it's, if I'm going to be able to train again, it wasn't happening, especially in LA. We had a lot of issues, which is why it's amazing now that so many vaccinations have, have put us into like the best situation, I think, in the entire world, I feel like. We have so many people back to work, opening up their businesses, things like that. But, you know, this was so... No, if someone had told me in March of 2020 that that you know, May 2021 would be the time that I finally get to feel like things are normal again. It would be, it would be crushing. And I'm glad I didn't know that. But still going through it, everyone had this collective grief of losing either their job, losing their routines, losing their ability to see their friends. I mean, there was so much, we lost so much and we're still not getting it back. And so this collective grief is important and we need to remember it because it gives us this uh, connection that, okay, everyone's struggling. And when I did finally go back to training, we the gym was open, but it was training outside and it was like last summer. And I was like, there's no way I'm gonna train outside. I'm sorry. I don't care if my dream is to be a UFC champion. Right now, with everything going on, I'm not going to go train because I was in an EMT program. I became an EMT. I got certified and everything for December. December is when I finished it. So I was in school. But other than that, it was like, I'm losing it. So when I got back to training, I was fully vaccinated. I've been fully vaccinated since March. And what it made me feel like, especially because a lot of people were coming back out of shape, it felt like I got pregnant. And by that, I mean that it felt like it was socially acceptable for me to be out of shape. Now, what are socially acceptable reasons for women to be out of shape? Well, they had a baby. They had a baby and they gave life and that's totally okay. And now they're getting back and they're dying and training and they're fat and they're, you know, that's what it felt like for the pandemic, even though I have no baby now. But I felt like I gave birth to something. And from now on, the training is focused on that. And like, I'm so grateful that I have the training, that I have all these things. But knowing that some people are still not out of it. Like I'm not out of it completely. No one is, but we're finally trying to get back. And so I love, I love that David had said, David Lay said that mindset, you know, we don't want to do things as you have to force yourself. And I know that that anxiety and depression and mental health, we want to be kind to ourselves, but it's not true. Self-care is not pampering yourself. Self-care is doing the things that need to be done. And so, yeah, there's a, there's a level of logical and practical ideas that have to come forth, whether someone else brings them to you. My mom is great for that. She's like, have you eaten today? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like she's there to keep me grounded in that, in that respect, but people need to take care of themselves. And by taking care of yourself, it requires you to actually get out of bed and get dressed. Now, can you give yourself a pat on the back? Can you clap for your damn self if you get out of bed? Hell yeah, you can but you're not done yet. <laughs> you know, like there's still things that you need to do. So I like that being nice to yourself, but you also have to force yourself to do things because no one else will. Yeah, absolutely. And you touched on something that I really want to dig into a little bit deeper too, which is this idea that there can be 
myriad causes for for being depressed, for being anxious, for for grieving, and sometimes we feel like we don't have a good enough reason to be yes. depressed. You brought up an example of like how, you know, there are socially acceptable reasons mm-hmm. for women to be out of shape. But in other situations, a, a woman may not feel like she, you know, like I must have done something wrong if I gained weight or something, right? And it's very much the same, I think, with mental health and, and trauma, right? I think that a lot of the time we get ourselves into a state where we don't feel like we don't give ourselves permission to mm-hmm. be traumatized. Mm-hmm. And if we don't admit that we're traumatized, then we can't fix it. Maybe that sounds a bit wishy-washy, but to give a personal example, right? I mean, I'm I'm quite lucky in the grand scheme of things. Uh, my job was able to go remote uh-huh. when the pandemic started. So I'm still here. I'm still working, right? I mean, I, I don't have a concern about getting tossed out onto the street. Most of my jujitsu friends are in a very different situation, right? Some of them have lost almost all of their revenue streams. You know, it, it's been, in addition to just losing the thing that they love, that's a very different situation. And I, I have felt depressed through this pandemic, but I haven't felt like I'm allowed to be depressed because I've had it so much better than a lot of other people. So I've, you know, it's been extraordinarily hard on me this last year, but I've also felt like, well, I'm, should I be allowed to, to feel depressed when everyone else has it so much worse? And I think a lot of people don't give themselves permission to admit that they have trauma. Mm-hmm. And th- the problem is like, we, we need to stop being judgy about the causes of people's trauma, right? Some people get traumatized because they've been through legitimate horrors, right? They've seen people die in front of them. They yep. grew up in a war zone. Some people get traumatized for much more benign things. You know, maybe they were bullied in high school. Maybe they just had one or two bad memories on the playground that stuck with them for life. And we can't make fun of people for that because the source of your trauma is totally different from the result of your trauma, right? Yes. People can have their entire lives ruined due to trauma that may have originated from something that seemed very benign at the time. But someone told me, I think it might have been you, is that, or it might have been Margot Ciccarelli. I don't remember. Someone told me this, but I thought it was a great idea that trauma is really just anything left unaddressed and anything can be traumatic. And it's not up to you and me to judge the source of someone's trauma, yes. right? If someone is suffering from depression because of something that we think is silly, it is not up to you or me to tell them that they don't deserve to be depressed or that they don't deserve to be battling with their mental health, right? That is not up to us to say the result of someone's trauma is very different from the symptom. And we need to stop being so judgy about whether someone deserves to be complaining about their mental health. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think it's also like, this is a horrible, horrible, you know, analogy. But uh, when you're in prison, you don't ask, what are you in for? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it doesn't so much matter. Like, you're there, right? So if we're, if we're feeling depressed, if we're dealing with trauma, it's not important to compare. Comparing griefs, and I have a problem with that, is comparing myself to to others, more so in the, the sense of imposter syndrome, in the sense that, oh my gosh, someone else is doing it better. And if I say that I'm the best and someone else comes along and does it better, like I'm, I'm going to be destroyed. My entire identity is not going to matter anymore. Like I'm, I'm going to be a fraud. I'm going to be canceled. And so when I compare myself, I have to remember that going back to the beginning when you, when you said, um, I don't even know if we were recording yet, but you said that jujitsu is very individual. Well, it is. We all have our own griefs, I guess, to get over. A lot of people come into jujitsu and they're like, I don't have good cardio. And so the, in their mindset, this narrative goes on about like, nope, cardio is not for me. I'm not good at cardio. So anything that like requires cardio, they're like, I'm just going to suck at this. Or my favorite, which I cannot relate to because I am like a pretzel. When they say I'm not flexible, I'm not flexible. Oh, that person's flexible, but I'm not, I'm not that flexible. And so I can't play spider. I'm not flexible. I can't play half guard because this and that, right? Limitations. On the other hand, some people will say, look, you have, you're, you're tall and lanky. You should definitely watch Keenan. You should definitely do what Keenan Cornelius does because he's tall and lanky. Well, just because Keenan is lanky and also does worm guard all these things, it's not because he's lanky. It's not because he's all of these things. Everyone is good at what they do. So what I like to talk about is the individual is finding your own asset, finding what you're good at. So try everything because as you should, as a white belt, blue belt, purple belt, figure out what works for you and then build upon those. And something that I learned that has helped me completely in my life 
I learned from a sports psychologist was you could always be more of something. And it's not, oh, I'm the type of person to do this, or I'm, oh, that's not me. I'm not that. That's not me. I could never do that. Or I don't want to do that or these things, but you could always be more of. So I am very talkative. Okay. Well, I can learn to be more of a listener. I don't like working out, but I can learn to like working out. If I find out parts of working out that I enjoy, I know that I like CrossFit. I know that I like lifting. I know that I can't lift by myself. Like I just won't do it. It's boring. I need to go to a class, things like that. So learning about your, yourself and learning about your, your traumas. Everyone has their traumas. It's learning how to address them and address them in a healthy manner, which requires professional help in the sense that you have someone who can bring you from point A to point B, right? Someone, it, it helps have a plan. So if you say like, I can't stop talking. It's ruining my relationships. It's ruining my school, whatever. And you say, okay, how can I learn to be a better listener? Well, this person is your accountability partner. If you, whatever you want to call them, your psychiatrist, psychologist, whatever, a life coach, you have someone that says, Hey, how's that going? How's that going on that, that journey of yours to be a better listener? And so someone to keep you in check. So much like David was talking about with forcing yourself, helping, having someone else to be your cheerleader and to help you to be like more rigid with yourself is great, but also not comparing yourself, not comparing the griefs and being able to figure out what your issue is, is really hard. And sometimes that takes listening to a podcast and hearing someone else speak about their traumas and how they dealt with it. I may go, nah, I could never do that. Like someone goes, yeah, I got into swimming and, and you know, I just love swimming. I'm like, okay, that wouldn't work for me. Just like I tell people you should do jujitsu. Well, maybe that's not great for everybody. Then do yoga, do, do a kickboxing class, do something, but it doesn't have to be exactly for you, but it could be beneficial to hear other people. So it's important to listen to people and take away what works for you, not necessarily try to become something or someone else. Have you ever read uh, Mindset by Carol Dweck? I have not. I'm going to oh, write that down. Yeah. So it, it is exactly what you're talking about. In fact, it's a, a, an extraordinary work. It's a great, great book. I highly recommend this book to basically almost anybody. But what, what she posits in this book is that generally there, you can have either a fixed mindset or a growth mindset. And you've probably heard people talking about growth mindset, growth mindset. Mm -hmm. That's, as far as I know, this book is where that term comes from. So the idea is, if you have a fixed mindset, basically you're looking at yourself as a series of attributes. Like, I am not athletic. I am oh. not good at worm guard. I am not good at jujitsu. And the mindset you have is that these are fixed attributes about yourself that you can, you simply cannot change. Mm -hmm. The alternative to that is a growth mindset, which is where you see yourself as independent of your attributes and able to manipulate those attributes. So rather than saying, I'm not good at jujitsu, you might say to yourself, if you have a growth mindset, well, I, I want to get better at jujitsu. I'm going to practice that. Or how can I practice that? So it's, it's a mindset where you're detached from your attributes and you understand that you can control those. And what Carol has found is that people with that growth mindset are markedly more successful in life, which really should not be surprising to anyone. But I highly recommend anyone fighting self-doubt read that book. It's just an absolutely awesome book if you want to learn about the power of mindset and how to craft a quality mindset. So that's Mindset by Carol Dweck. I'll put it in the show notes as well. And I think that we all suffer from that that problem of having a fixed mindset where we simply, we have these defeatist thoughts. Like I, I know I have had that where I've, I've thought before in the past, like I'm just not athletic, right? Mm -hmm. Or I'm, you know, I'm just not good at this other particular skill set. And I think the problem is that sometimes when and people are battling with mental health issues, they might say things like that to themselves, like, I'll just never be happy or something to that mm -hmm. effect, right? They, they see that as a fixed part of themselves, but learning to have a growth mindset teaches you to realize that it's not that I will never be happy. It's just, I'm not happy at this particular moment, but that's not who I am. That's a, that's a dial that I can turn up and down on if I work at it. So learning to have a growth mindset is key to success, but also key to just having a good mental health, right? I mean, it's, it, it gives you, if you can develop a growth mindset, it makes you feel like you have some bit of control of the world around you. Right. And 
I think what's hard for people to understand if they're deep, deep into depression and they feel a, a full loss of control, how can they go from feeling like they have no control over anything to controlling their thoughts? And I think that's, that's such a gap that people need to go through often. And so when I, when I talk about trauma or depression or like helping yourself, I try to talk in like the early stages, like, little steps, the little steps that it takes, right? So I wouldn't tell someone who wants to go into jujitsu, I wouldn't start showing them, you know, spider guard and X guard and sweeps and all those things. I would teach them to just get on the mat and feel comfortable laying down on the mat doing a shrimp escape. That is like the small, small thing. Like now if someone comes in, they were already a college wrestler or they did, you know, college basketball or soccer, or they, they've been an athletic person they are going to have this like that uh, self-awareness and just that ability to push themselves. And there's certain qualities that they're already going to be coming into onto the mat with. With me, I didn't. All I did was Girl Scouts, which is really funny. Side anecdote. My my coach was kind of telling us like, you know what? It's always better to leave a place better than you left it. And I'm like, wow, I learned that in Girl Scouts. I never thought my MMA coach would be teaching me something that I learned in Girl Scouts. <laughs> but it's Something that I was never, never, ever, ever physical. Like I rode horses and stuff, but I used to think that working out was for people who were like all about working out. Like I didn't know that like everyone should do it. So this sense of self that you can do something always comes in first steps. That's, that's kind of like my audience, I guess. There are people who know what they're doing and they're already like, you know, way on their journey, but I treat everyone like they're a white belt. And I know what all those mental hurdles are. And I know all the excuses that you tell yourself that require so much like kind of motivation. And sometimes it'll take that special spark, a podcast you listen to, a book you read, you know, watching the Today Show and -and so-and-so comes on and says, I did this crazy small thing and it changed my life. So it's those small steps that make you feel like you do have control. And then when you have those foundational, you know, self realizations, you can move on to like reading these books and reading how you can control things and stuff. And that's what I love about it because in my journey, I already know that I can put that into use. I mean, you already said, I'm already talking about Carol's, you know, her whole growth versus fixed mindset. And so I think with a fixed mindset, Sometimes we kind of go, ew, people are so close minded. And it's like, well, there's a reason. There's always a reason. Like if someone is an asshole to you on the street, I've learned to kind of go, okay, they're not an asshole. They weren't born an asshole. They didn't decide today I'm going to be an asshole. They're obviously dealing with their own issues, whether they just got broken up with, whether they just got in a fight with their girlfriend, now they got to go to work or they just got called into work and they don't want to go. You never really know. Now, does that give you full freedom to, to go be an asshole? No, not necessarily. But there is a level of like understanding that people are on their own paths whether they've even started it or not. And like, I love calling it a journey. I know that's kind of cliche. We always say like, your jujitsu journey. But really when you start on the mats, like it's not, you don't go into jujitsu going, I'm going to go be a black belt. You know, what is it? 10 years, you know, average eight to 10 years. It took me eight years and I was full time. So to, to go into something and say like me starting at MMA, like, I'm going to go be a UFC champion. No, there's a lot of steps before that. The first step is I got to make sure that I can get punched in the face and not freak out, right? So I'm like, okay, check. My first amateur fight did that. So I like to always think of things in small steps. And so it doesn't matter how big your dream is, how big the change you want to make is. That's fine. Especially it's great if you have something to look at and say, okay, I want to be like that. Um, that's great. Like the little yellow bikini on the weight loss journey that people like to talk about. They just hang on their wall, which that is a whole thing (laughs) to talk about. But I mean, having that motivation and then, but having the means to do so are two separate things. And the thing that I love about jujitsu is that all you have to do is show up and you know, it's very similar to professional help. When I did see a psychologist, I would actually dread going like during the week, I'd be like, oh man, I can't wait to talk to him and just like figure these things out. And then the day comes and I'm like, oh, I don't want to go and do that stuff and talk about all those things. And like, I just want to sit on the couch and play property brother game on my, on my phone. And it's really interesting that you have those, this idea that just show up. When I got back to training, Anthony, my coach, Anthony Hardonk at Dynamics MMA in Santa Monica, he was like, you showed up. I'm like, yeah, but like, I'm, I had to sit around. 
sit out like a couple rounds and he's like, yeah, but you showed up. So, and now, and I just posted this on my Instagram and in January, I posted it just how like fat I had gotten and out of shape, which I knew I was having Tim Hortons probably like three times a day. It'd be like hot chalky time. And it'd be like two in the morning. We'd go to Tim Hortons and get a hot chocolate. I was eating and doing whatever I wanted. Spoken like, like a, someone who is dating a Canadian for sure. <laughs> yes. I love Tim's. And so when I, when I posted a photo today, I'm like, wow, I really, you know, slimmed down. Now my goal was not to slim down. I don't care. Like I'll, I started wearing medium t-shirts. That, that was me in the pandemic. Like, okay, I'm not fitting in my clothes. Fuck, change my clothes. <laughs> like, I don't care. I'll wear baggier clothes. So I'm, I was never trying to just like change my shape. Obviously getting back to fight shape is a lot more than just losing weight or looking good or anything like that. But those are definitely benefits. But, but you know, just showing up has led me to get back into shape to where I don't have to sit out rounds. Even yesterday during training, I was like, wow, you know, so-and-so just came into the intermediate class and he's dying and no one is judging him because that was also me a month ago. I was absolutely dying. So it's just, it's interesting. I just love the whole idea of the path and then having small, small steps. And especially when you go get professional help, like a psychologist, or you go to a jiu-jitsu gym that actually has a curriculum or an MMA or kickboxing gym, all you have to do is show up and someone else will do the work in terms of figuring out what's next. What are you going to learn today? How are we going to judge your progress? Like all those things just show up. Yeah. I love what you're saying here. And we advocate for this a lot on the show about focusing on building quality habits instead of focusing on result obsession, right? right Where you've got right. some pie in the sky dream and you're, you know, you've got some desire of something that you want to achieve five or 10 years from now. If that's your focus, you know, and, and you're only looking at some long-term wish, what's going to mm-hmm. wind up happening is that regardless of whether you achieve or fail to achieve that, you're going to be miserable. It's way better for you to build a practice and to focus on quality execution of that practice every single day. And, you know, people talk about how jujitsu changed their life. And I think a big part of that is because jujitsu, it's, it's just a practice, right? It gives you, yeah, it gives you a practice that you can do every day and it makes you feel like you're getting better, right? It gives you positivity about your body, you know, about your ability to defend yourself. It, it teaches you how to learn in some ways, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, the thing that I got out of jujitsu that I really didn't think I was going to get was it taught me strategy and systems thinking and how to deal with people and how to deal with stressful situations. That's not why I got into the sport, but that's that's what I got out of it at the end of the day. And it was way more valuable than just learning to protect myself in a street fight. And right. that mindset of building, just focusing on the process, having a good practice and focusing on the practice is so key. Like one thing that in jujitsu, you know, we always do is we belittle these other martial arts because we've got it in our heads that like jujitsu is the real fighting and people who do Taekwondo are just deluding themselves. But I've moved away from that as I've gotten older and I've progressed in the yard because like I got into this because I wanted to be this like badass who could defend himself on the street. Yep. But that has never materialized in the 12 <laughs> or 13 years I've, I practiced this sport. Right? I have never needed to defend myself, you know, in a street fight. And the one thing mm-hmm. I've realized is if you ever get yourself into the situation where you have to do that, you screwed up a long time yes. ago. Like you made, you made a series of mistakes that got you into that place. And of course, as I get older, you know, I'm, I've been married for a long time. I'm a dad, right? Like mm-hmm. the odds of me getting into a street fight and ever having to use jujitsu in a real life situation are only shrinking, right? And at this point, I would be surprised if in my life I ever need to use this thing to fight. Mm-hmm. So what I've come out of jujitsu with is that like, unless you are a fighting professional like yourself, the need to fight is actually not that useful. However, the practice that you get out of it and the lessons that you learn from a consistent practice are extraordinarily useful. And for that reason, like I'm not going to be judgy if someone wants to do Aikido, if they want to do Taekwondo, if they are consistently following a practice that's making them better. Like I don't care if they're going to be a a champion cage fighter, as long as they use that practice to improve the self, that's the most important thing to me. Absolutely. For me, you know, obviously learning how to learn. I was in college already when I started jujitsu and then, you know, throughout training, I was still in college and I've, I've not even used my degree much. I have a degree in creative writing, English. And although I did write for Gracie Mag and I love to write, I didn't get my job because of 
my degree. I was in progress of that, but it was just the fact that I know how to communicate well and writing was always my passion. For me, it was jujitsu kind of taught me how to go my own way. Cobrina, who I got my black belt under, who was Charles Cobrina, I, I learned from him and it was always this quote, like in his, it, like the first time I ever really talked to him through email, it said, never let things happen, make them happen. And who knows where he got that, but it's, it's, it's just, it's always stuck with me. You know, ever since training with him, it's like, yes, always make things happen. And also his jujitsu is very action reaction, right? So just because I'm sitting there doesn't mean someone's going to do something. I have to create a reaction. If I push someone, what are they going to do? Okay, cool. They're probably going to come back into me, which is where I can take an opportunity there. But that, that obviously translates. I'm not going to go push someone on the street, but if I want action or if I want something to change, I need to be the person to say, this is, this is happening. I'm changing this or we're doing this now. I need to be the person that changes things. And I'm the go getter, absolutely go getter. When I started training, I was a, I was competing after three months, but, but I did seminars with my ex. And we did seminars and I booked all of his seminars and I was the one that was making all the flyers and, and the Facebook invites and all these things. And then I did it on my own starting in 2016. And, you know, 2017 and February, I'm going around Europe teaching last minute seminars as a purple be- or brown belt female. And I have to say female because most people don't associate jujitsu with females. They associate it with men. And so obviously already being an underdog, you know, people don't really get seminars as brown belts. People don't really get seminars as females. And I was doing both internationally. So that was huge. Always doing things like that. But the biggest thing that I learned in jujitsu was practicing stressful situations. I always found myself, like I said, growing up, I was super, super emotional. Like everything was grief. Everything was lost. Everything was just, oh God, this feels awful. I have so many emotions. And, you know, putting yourself in a position, especially when you do like specific training, like say you're in, you, you're in top side control and I have to get out or escape or advance my position. Those are things that you really learn that one, I mean, practicing it gives you the idea of like, I'm putting myself in this situation so that when it does happen in real life or in a competition or whichever it is, I'm able to fit, to know my outs, just like driving on a freeway, which I do nonstop in LA traffic. You got to know your exits, right? You don't want to be driving next to someone directly going the same speed. You kind of want to space out. You want to know if, you know, there's a, someone breaking suddenly, if you can go into the left lane or the right lane, you always know your exits. In wrestling, you know that if it's a bad shot, you better get out of there because, you know, for MMA, you're going to get punched, right? So it's knowing when to go, when to stop, all these things. And also the emotional toll of it. Like there were times when I was a purple belt that I'd get my guard passed in training and I was so hard on myself that I would literally just stop. And my training partner would be like, you realize that, you know, the, 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 the role doesn't stop when I pass your guard. And I'd look at him and I'd go, just, just take my back and submit me already. <laughs> yeah. And I was such a brat, really, to be honest. But putting myself in those situations, like, like I, I get beat up all the time. Yesterday, for example, I have a training partner, Audrey Winters, who is a, technically she's a blue belt in jujitsu, but she's sort of just the all around MMA. She's undefeated amateur MMA fighter. And a little bit bigger than me, but who cares? It's jujitsu. Well, every time I got taken down in our MMA training yesterday, she would mount me. She would pass my guard. I could not get up. She was constantly on top of me. And I could say, wow, I'm a black belt. Like, this is my thing. And I'm just getting crushed. Well, no, it's just different. It's a different situation. I'm also wearing 14 ounce gloves and shin guards. And it's very hard to pass a guard and to get an underhook and do all these things. But I'm not going to make that as an excuse. I'm going to work harder. And instead of going, oh my gosh, I totally got just squished out there. I say, no, there's obviously a weakness and there's something that I need to address here. And just because I have a black belt in jujitsu, which is entirely different, let me tell you, because I am a guard puller and a gi player, which is completely different than MMA, about which is all about being on top. I have a lot to learn. And so practicing stressful situations enables me to be in a stressful situation in the future and not freak out and instead rely on my training, rely on the systems that I am aware of, that I know of, and to keep myself calm. Because I know that in jujitsu or in MMA or in any situation, if you freak out, which I have done multiple, multiple, multiple times, 
it doesn't end up well for me. I've been on the end of like having a flat tire on the side of the freeway and calling someone and they're like, wow, I thought you were getting raped. Like that's how awful you sounded and and like just out of breath. And like, you know, cause I call people crying. Those are the things that I've dealt with in the past. So jujitsu kind of makes you go, okay, we're in a supervised area of this is a maintainable amount of stress. And I'm going to be able to perform within it. And maybe I'm not going to perform well, but it's training. And as long as I keep trying and keep working on new ways to get better at something, I'm going to do it. Yeah, there's two really powerful concepts in there that you talked about. I mean, one is that lesson you learned from Cabrinha about learning to make things happen. I mean, that's that's a battle that I also had with mm-hmm. jujitsu where, you know, for a long time I was up until like almost black belt, I would just I was just getting murdered, especially if I was fighting someone really aggressive, they would just crush me all the time. And eventually I realized the problem was I was not being assertive. I was letting them come to me, right? Mm -hmm. We would slap hands, we'd bump fists. Then I'd sit down on the ground and lie down like an upside down turtle. And I just let them do whatever they want. And I (laughs) I realized like, okay, if you're going to, if you're going to sit down, if you're going to play a seated guard or a supine guard, you better get your ass in motion. Like, don't just sit there and let your opponent just dictate the pace. Even if you're in that bottom position, you have to make things happen. You Mm -hmm. have to be assertively going for grips, trying to play that position like you own it, not like you're on the defensive. And that mindset of learning to live your life like you're being assertive and not waiting for things to happen and then going to defend them. It's such a game changer when you learn to uh, apply that. The other thing you brought up too is just the power of jujitsu as a a laboratory where you can learn to get comfortable in difficult situations. That's one of the most powerful things I think about it. And the big takeaway that I think a lot of people get is they learn to get comfortable in situations that to a lay person would give them a massive adrenaline dump, right? But after you've been training for even just a small amount of time, suddenly things like mount and side control, they just don't seem as scary as they used to. And that kind of inoculation against pressure is incredibly important because once you learn that that tactic works, you can apply that in other areas of your life. And eventually Mm -hmm. you start to build a practice where you're trying to push yourself outside of your comfort zone to improve and improve. And I would, I would challenge our listeners. I would say that one thing that I think everyone should try in terms of pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone because you want to improve is to consider seeking help, mm-hmm. mental health help. And I'm not necessarily saying that do this if you're depressed or if you're anxious. I'm saying even if you're the happiest person in the world, you should try it, right? Yeah. And, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Here's the reason why I say this, right? First of all, jujitsu people are some of the most stubborn motherfuckers I've ever met in my <laughs> life. Like, it is a, yep. a ruggedly individualistic sport. There is currently, uh, you know, there's this very like bro macho culture in jujitsu. Mm-hmm. People want to do it all on their own. And I, I have found that people are so hesitant to seek help with mental health. First of all, because like you said, there is somewhat of a stigma, I think, around it. I think that people, they look at mental health as a different thing from physical health, which is mm-hmm. a, a huge mistake. Like, it's, it's funny. I mean, if you broke your shin bone, you would not say like, I refuse to go to the doctor and admit that something's wrong with me. No, 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 no. But, but for some reason, if you're depressed or if you want to build a stronger mindset, people are mortified at the thought of like going to see a psychologist or a psychiatrist, which mm-hmm. is crazy to me. I would challenge our listeners Like whatever your current mental health state is at the moment, whether it's good, bad, or somewhere in between, like after this episode, book a session with someone who can help. It can be just a therapist to talk to. It can be a psychiatrist, can be whatever you think is the right thing for you. Could be a coach, just like a, Mm -hmm. like a mindset coach. I mean, in a lot of situations, if your job might even cover that for you, so you don't even have to pay. And if that's the case, what's the downside to you to try this? There is literally zero risk if assuming that you can get someone else to pay for it to just try one class. It's not going to wreck you in any way. It could only possibly be helpful. So much like how us jujitsu people constantly annoy our friends and say, please just go to jujitsu one time. It'll change your own. Please just try it. Same thing for going to see someone who can help you with the mindset game, right? I would say that I challenge everyone, if you haven't already, and frankly, even if you have, to just try it. Find someone who can help you on the the mental side of things and give it a go. And, you know, even if your benefits package or whatever doesn't cover it, 
at least look into the cost because what you'll probably find is that one session is not going to be that expensive. Just like how we badger everyone in our social circle to try jujitsu, I would badger everyone listening to this to just try it. Just go to a coach, right? I mean, at the moment, I currently, at the advice of other people in the jujitsu community, I've started seeing a mindset coach and it's been super eye-opening and I'm glad that I did Mm -hmm. because even if it doesn't benefit me, and I, I think it is, but even if it doesn't, it allows me to say to an audience that I'm doing this, right? I'm normalizing this behavior. I'm like, if if Steve can do it and if Aaron can do it, then there's no reason why everyone else out there can't also do it, right? right. You wouldn't refuse to get coached on jujitsu in terms of technique, right? Like you, you wouldn't be like, I'm not gonna, I don't need a coach. I'm not gonna let John Danaher tell me about systems. <laughs> I can, having a coach is a sign of weakness. I mean, you would never say that. And so, I think that we also need to accept that we should allow ourselves to be coached on the mental game just as well as on on anything else. And that, you know, regardless of whether you are trying to overcome a mental health issue or you just want to be a better version of yourself, I highly advocate seeking professional help here and not looking at it as some sort of weakness, but like just just fucking try it. Just drop everything and try it. It, Honestly, what do you stand to lose by just doing one session? I would strongly recommend you go try it. There's my sales pitch. Steve done with my sales pitch. Back to Aaron. That was great. That was a fucking infomercial. (laughs) That was amazing. And obviously I'm going to add to that. Part of the reason why people don't go to get therapy is again, going back to the self versus our thoughts on how they're different. A lot of people who haven't delved as far as we have and and been able to decipher that will think, why am I going to go to a therapist? Like, does this therapist think they know more about me than me? And I think maybe that's part of the reason people don't like it because they don't want to be told how to think, how to, how to feel, right? Well, it's okay. And and this is a really good uh, idea. It's like, so say that I'm talking with you and you were like, I can't do this podcast today. And I'm like, but we're right here. We're about to do it, you know? And you're like, I re- something came up and I really can't do it, right? So then I could go back and say, uh, this is not the case, but I didn't even train today. I took tr- I took time off training to do this podcast and this guy doesn't even show up, blah, 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 blah. And then if you have someone kind of come in and say, well, maybe he had a family emergency and you also don't train on Thursdays, so you can probably reschedule. It just takes that person to go, well, you know, like that devil and the angel on the shoulder. It's that ability to see something a little bit differently so that it's not as hurtful. And going back to also the, uh, the coaching you said, like, would you not, would you turn down a session with John Danaher? Well, that's also weird because you say that having a coach is never like a sign of weakness. I've had a lot of cases in the competition realm which I don't know how much experience you have there, but I, I traveled the world and I was at the high level tournaments. I competed in the Solo Americano in Brazil. I competed at the Abu Dhabi World Championship there. I, you know, the worlds in Irvine, California and the Pans and all the, all the IBJJF. And if I didn't have a coach and I complained about it, people were like, what? Why do you need a coach? Like people thought that having a coach was weakness and that if I, if I was not feeling up to competing because I didn't have someone there to give me the set of eyes on the outside, tell me the time, calm me down, keep me centered. You know, people thought that was weak. And that was something that I fought for, that it's not weakness to have to have a coach, to have someone say, hey, let's make this a little bit easier for you. And and also when you talked about having sort of a almost a pedestal to be able to speak about this because you you yourself have, have gone and done it. Like someone was who has never stepped on the mat is not going to sit there and brag about jujitsu or even speak about it in a way that they, that anyone can learn anything from because they probably don't have their own experiences. My experiences with mental health was not enough to, to have people listen to me. Unfortunately, it was my dad's suicide that gave me the pedestal to speak. And what I mean by that is once I had this awful trauma that other people recognized as like, oh, never, I, I never want to go through that. And obviously there's a lot of stigmatized ideas against suicide and there's a lot more questions than answers. People gave me the, the pedestal to speak about mental health. And assume, like, even if I had never dealt with mental health and then here my dad is, you know, like with, d- dead by suicide, I still would have done what I did. And I think that people need to 
to realize that they don't need a big life event to need help. You don't need a pedestal to need help. You don't, when I was writing my, my essays to get into college at the time, I had no real trauma, you know, like my parents were still together, you know, lived in a middle-class family. I rode horses. So everyone thought I was rich and, <laughs> and I had like a pretty normal life. And all of these people were like, yeah, I was raised by my grandma or well, I remember the day my grandma died or I want to be a race car driver. Like I didn't have any of these. And I wrote my essay. I remember on the fact that I didn't have all these traumas and that I worried that it didn't make me better as a person. And I think that's something huge for a 17 year old to believe. But now that I have gone through these things, it gives me that perspective that no, I had a lot of issues. And in fact, I was dealing with a lot of um, verbal abuse from my dad that I didn't recognize. So I'm not saying that you're going to go to a therapist and be like, holy crap, I've been under the the, you know, abuse. I've been dealing with abuse my whole life. I'm not saying you're going to figure that out, but you're going to figure things out about yourself that you were not able to see. It's seeing things from a different perspective. It's putting yourself down into a mold and then being able to look at it from afar. And this is something that is so perfect for people who have social anxiety, people who have, who are nervous about how they, how they look how they feel. If they're not, if you're not satisfied with yourself in any manner, there's a way to become satisfied with yourself. Go to the journey. If you, if you're not satisfied with your weight, go on that weight loss journey, but you cannot get lost in the fact that the result, like you said, the result obsession is not going to solve your problem. The problem is your, is the fact that you're not okay with yourself. Mm -hmm. So I love that the, that, that therapy these days has been redefined. It's about seeing things in a healthier way. If you could have some, if you could have a tutor for free while you're going through all your college courses, you'd probably do it right now. If you had to pay 50, a hundred bucks a month to see them, you'd probably still do it because you'd realize the power of saying, Hey, I don't understand this math question. Can you explain it to me? <laughs> you know, I don't understand why this person's not texting me back. Can you explain this to me? As dumb and trivial as you think things are, therapists are great for answering those questions. So for, for therapy and things like that, that's my pitch. My pitch is like, I don't think that I need to necessarily speak about the benefits of it, but just that I need, I speak towards the hesitancy of getting therapy. My mom, who was the one that found my dad, dead from a suicide by a gunshot wound is never been to like a constant therapist. We went to a grief therapist and stuff, but she had really bad experiences. So here I am kind of like trying to be my mom's therapist as I live with her and I try to help her and not everyone is going to get help, but that's why this matters. That's why, especially if you're young, it will give you the foundational, the system, right? The, th the thoughts, the motivations, the understandings, the inner workings of everything that's going on with you that helps you to deal with issues. We are not going to go through life unscathed. And, it's, it's, and the pandemic is entirely obvious of that, right? We talk about the 1930s and the depression and it's like, wow, those, that sucked, you know? That must've been really hard for people living back then. Oh, well. And then we experience our own collective and this is not just the US, this is the entire world. And so I think that the pandemic has given an opportunity to see that we are human, that people go through the same things, and that also there are disparities in terms of the ability to get help. And so there are people who would love to be able to speak to a therapist. And so like, like you said, Steve, if you have it in your benefits package, if you have it with your insurance, private or Medi-Cal, which is what I have, things like there's different programs that you can go through, but look it up, look into it. It's not going to hurt you in any way. It's not going to be anything but an investment. And I think that's what we need right now. Absolutely. Wonderful points. Now, I would say that the next question then, and my final question is, as leaders in our community and as coaches, what can we do to cultivate an environment where this kind of stuff is something that our students actively seek out because i mean part of it of course people need to they need to tune their own mindset so that they understand that it is okay and actually a good thing to look for mental health to seek people to kind of help you on the journey of the mental game part of that is an individual thing but an another part of that is cultural right and, and environmental context i mean 
one thing that I have I have observed, especially in the last year, is that jujitsu people, especially very prominent jujitsu coaches, are like some of the most judgy people I've ever seen. And a lot of this, unfortunately, is ego. You know, there's all of this bullshit about how jujitsu kills the ego. Sorry, it it, it doesn't. White belt mindset. <laughs> I'm sorry it doesn't. Maybe for some people it does. But my my feeling coming out of this pandemic has been jujitsu does not kill the ego. What it's going to do is it's going to give you the confidence to be a bigger and bolder version of whoever you actually are. So if you're a if you're a good, humble person, jujitsu might make you more of that. But if you're a, a bully or if you just have a bad attitude, jujitsu might give you the confidence to be even more so, right? And I mean, the one thing about jujitsu that I find is interesting, you compare jujitsu to I mean, look, I have no data in front of me, so I may be wrong about this, but looking at it casually, right? When I look at the demographics of other sports and I compare it to jujitsu, the one thing about jujitsu that stands out is it is full of 20 something athletic young men, right? <laughs> and we're always going on about how do we get more women into the sport? You know, you know, and even beyond that, how do we get older people into the sport? Well, first of all, we've got to stop acting like jujitsu is a sport that is only for athletic young men because that becomes self-fulfilling. So if you're going to go out there on your gym social and post a bunch of like wolves and sheep and sheep dogs and bro fit type stuff, like you are going to attract the kind of people that you're speaking to. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot, I think, that we as gym owners, as figures in the community need to do to send out a more welcoming message, right? I mean, I know a bunch of uh, old ass men and women who do judo. I don't know that many old ass men and women who do jujitsu, right? It seems very much mm -hmm. like a young man's sport. And I think, I think that we need to change that. And I think that part of this conversation then becomes, are, are we as coaches by being so judgy and, and and kind of like creating this aura of how we should be invincible warrior monks, are we also somehow sending out an invisible signal to, to our students that you're expected to be this perfect warrior, you're expected to be a rugged individualist, and are we somehow sending a subtle signal that would discourage people from seeking help if they need it? I like that. But I think what, you, what you're saying is sport, um, and I think sport is different. So when I started training, I thought everyone competed and that's not true. Most people don't like the majority of people will never step on a competition mat. So that's why I learned to, to separate them. Now, when you go into a gym and you say, I'm going to be a black belt world champion, they're going to hold you to that. Your coach is going to mm -hmm. say, all right, I expect you to be here twice a day. I expect you to be dieting, working out all those things, you know? And then you're like, wait, I got a full-time job and three kids at home. And they're like, well, I think you should uh, go over your priorities again. Mm -hmm. It's, it's not meant to go be a world champion. And I think that's what takes the most light people like Gordon, Gordon Ryan, I, man, I even like choke when I try to say his name. It's that bad. People like that who are just pieces of shit to begin with who come into jujitsu and then use the platform to be more of a dick. That's a very, that's an anomaly. That's not what this is for. So when we talk about training, we talk about training, training for life, training for just to train on that journey for yourself. Now I only, and when I say only, I say fucking only trained from the beginning with high level. When I first started, I walked into a gym and it happened to be world champion Hamala Bahal. Okay. And when I started training with him and then I realized he's like a Michael Jordan of jujitsu, then, you know, Cobrina rolls into town and he's, you know, legend status and multiple time world champion. And he hadn't been, I don't think he had become an ADCC champion yet, but then he will. So when I went over to his, it was like, that's when I went full time because I got laid off of my travel job. I took a semester off school and was like, I'm a blue belt, but let's do this, you know? And I ended up getting ranked highly in every belt that I was, that I was in. And then when I met Gianni Grippo, my ex, he was a brown belt at the time and he was at Henzo's and then he moved over to Marcelo's and I moved out there when I graduated uh, college. So then I was with Marcelo Garcia, who is recognized as the GOAT, greatest of all time. And so here I am on these competition teams, putting myself at the highest, highest, highest level that I possibly could find throughout my entire journey. And I can tell you that it was so awful for my mental health. Mm -hmm. It was, it was, Oh, you want to be a champion? Okay. We are going to have to do that. Oh, you didn't do that thing. You're not making weight. Oh, it must be your fault. It's like, Kobe, I just got my period. <laughs> There's like things that actually are in my way. And it doesn't mean that I'm not trying hard enough. So what I always learned was I'm trying, I'm putting effort. If I am putting effort, that's all that matters. And then 
And when it came down to being so anxious and, and wanting the result of a, of a tournament so bad that I actually self-sabotaged and I was so nervous that it might, that I either had an adrenaline rush and I had no cardio to finish the match. And even though I was up on, up on points, I it just got away from me by the end because 10 minutes is too long of a time to be able to fight. But having that high expectation for so long and comparing myself, literally comparing myself to my opponents. And then if I got beat by someone, okay, then how do I fight them again? Because obviously being a girl, there's not as many people to fight against. And so you're going to fight against the same people. I lost the same person three times. Do I still feel like I can beat her? Hell yeah. But did I lose three times? Every single time. Yeah. On three different occasions. No gi, gi. We fought in Abu Dhabi. We fought on fight to win. I mean, different rule sets, everything. And I still lost her three times. So yeah, I've dealt with a lot of that, but that's not for the average person. For the average person who doesn't want to become a black belt world champion, which is most people, that's who what you need to talk to. That's what you need to talk about in terms of, of training instead of teaching. And so I, I think that also just to sum it up is competitive sport is competitive sport and it's always going to be cutthroat. But if you, if you want to shed light on the fact that jujitsu is great for the everyday average person, like don't do a step class in your, in your office. Like my mom does go to jujitsu. You can have the social aspect. You have friends. You have people that are worried about you if you don't show up because it's such a routine and consistent thing. You have the ability to goal set, whether it's another stripe on your belt or if so-and-so, if Susan keeps on getting me in a darce, my goal can become, don't let Susan darce me. And so there's different goal setting. So everything that mental wellness professionals speak about that is healthy for your mind, healthy for your body, healthy for your soul, healthy for your happiness. Those are things that you can find in jujitsu and all those douchebags that post online of their muscles because they're on steroids or that they're talking shit and calling someone out because they happen to have money and they want to put money on a match. Those are not the people that you need to look into or listen to or even follow. Those people are shit bags. And I will go to my grave saying that that people who use their their pedestal for evil <laughs> or for shit talking or things like that, that's not who you need to gravitate towards. It's the people who remain human. To be able to remain human is huge. You don't see a lot of billionaires, professional athletes that are able to remain humble and human. But if you have someone like that in your life who does jujitsu, like I'm talking about on the mat, you know, in your life too. But if you have that, follow that person. Look at what they do. Look at their daily habits. Because in the end, people who act like assholes and think that a gold medal is what makes them happy or is going to fulfill all of their dreams and goals, they're wrong. That's not the person you need to look to. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think that one thing that people often don't think about, I know that I, I tragically made this mistake when I started my, my journey. I love that we call it a journey. No one ever calls it a journey in anything know. else. It's like when I started my accounting <laughs> journey, you know, I, right? but when I, when I started my journey, I, I made my gym selection based on literally what came up in Google first when mm-hmm. I searched for like Brazilian Same. Jiu-Jitsu Vancouver. <laughs> that turned out to be a tragic mistake. And <laughs> so much of how much you're going to get out of the sport comes down from the culture that you surround yourself with, right? Yep. If you walk into a gym and it's just like total bro culture where, you know, they, they accept nothing but gold medals, like you're probably going to wind up coming out of their basket case. Yep. Um, the best gyms don't do that. And so ch- I find that choosing a gym is one of the most important decisions that you'll make. And I think a lot of the situations where people have a just an incredibly negative experience in jujitsu, it comes from gym selection, right? Table selection, as they call it in poker, you chose the wrong table to play at. And I think that in the world of jujitsu, like choosing the right gym is so important. And the duty on coaches, I think, is to create the kind of culture where people are using jujitsu as a practice for personal growth. If your goal as a coach is, hey, I won 10 gold medals at Worlds and I want every one of my students to win 10 gold medals in Worlds, I think you're tragically missing the point of what jujitsu is actually all about. I would also say that, you know, similarly to the example that you give, if you're using your platform as a a high-profile jujitsu celebrity to 
put down other people, to elevate yourself at the expense of others, yes. you're tragically misunderstanding what martial arts are actually all about. Mm -hmm. and, and that's unfortunate, right? The martial arts are, especially jujitsu, it's not about getting a tap on the mat. That is the outcome of the practice. But there's so much more to that than just what actually happens when you're rolling, right? There's there's so much more to jujitsu than that. And as a high-level coach, you need to embody the good things of the sport. Unfortunately, I feel like the people who don't do that, they're probably actually contributing to a lot of these mental health issues because they're creating a culture where people feel it's not okay to ask for help, right? They feel like they're supposed to be a gold medalist or bust. And I think that that's bullshit. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. Yeah, you're right. You're right. And I think me coming from like elite gyms where it was like, okay, I want to be legend status like this dude. They're going to hold you accountable and they're going to, and all they know is to show you the way that they did it. And that doesn't work these days. You know, like a lot of the guys come from Brazil where in Brazil it's like, Hey, you just train really hard and it's all you worry about it. And you sleep in the gym mats and you all live together in an apartment. Well, those things weren't really, I mean, people tried doing that in the U S and that was tragic mm -hmm. and things that happened there. And so it's like, you can't recreate, you have to adapt and people have to realize that you walk into a gym at your own free will. You're giving someone money. You are paying someone for a service. You are the customer, and, right? Exactly. The customer is always right. If you, if your relationship <laughs> with your coach who you're paying is abusive or toxic, or if it's ruining your life, you yep. have fundamentally misunderstood how this transaction is supposed to work. Exactly. And I understand that there's more to it. Absolutely. You become family. I get that. But you don't become family by winning medals. You don't become family by calling people creonches or traitors because they go and train with someone else or they go to an open mat. You know, it's there's a lot of negativity that can come from people who defend themselves by saying that they are defending the sanctity of jiu-jitsu. Oh, boy. But that is not the case. Jiu-jitsu is individual, like we have said. It is about the self. It is about the personal growth of what you can do. Now, if that constitutes like becoming a world champion, hell yes. But if you are sacrificing your entire personal life for that goal and you don't achieve it and you become depressed after that, that's harmful. Go see a professional. <laughs> Go see a professional before you do that. Go see a professional during that. There are ways to become a world champion without having to be miserable, without suffering, without being a dick, without having to create negativity in your life. And the idea of positivity is not the absence of negativity, just as much as the mental wellness is not the absence of mental illness. It is the idea that you're helping yourself become accustomed to the hardships of life through a system of fighting and sweating and likely farting on people. <laughs> well, my, I think the worst thing, you know, I've been off the mats for 14 months since the pandemic started at this point. And the thing that I am not looking forward to is people sweating in my eyeballs again. That's the one <laughs> thing that I... We share the same tears. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the one thing I do find totally odd is there's so many people in jujitsu who are like, they don't think that, you know, the coronavirus is really that big a deal, but they're terrified of ringworm. It's like, guys, <laughs> come on. I mean, like one of these is like an obnoxious skin condition but if someone shows up to the mat with ringworm they're gonna like fumigate the whole building but the other thing yeah. is like a legitimate like deadly virus and it's i mean come on let's get let's prioritize properly is all i ask exactly, anyway exactly. hopefully by the time this episode hits the public most of these problems will all be taken care of and we can get back together again and i man i'd love to i've met so many awesome people in the last year through this podcast i would love to actually see some of them in person i mean really Absolutely. honestly at this point i'd love to just get out of my house i'll take what i can get <laughs> but I, I guess, Aaron, before we tie this up, close this up, anything that you want to plug? Where can people find you? Where can they catch your work? Yeah. So I'm on Instagram all the time. In fact, my boyfriend and I probably talk mostly through Instagram <laughs> versus anything else. So my full name, Aaron Hurley, is my username there. Also, we have Submit the Stigma, which is an Instagram handle, which has stories about how people have used jujitsu for their own mental health journey and vice versa. The website for Submit the Stigma, where you can read about my story and kind of what we do and what we have done in the past is submitthestigma.org. I also have my own website, which just has all of my work in terms of being a motivational speaker, being a teacher and a competitor. That's erinhurley.com. And that's about it. I mean, I've, I've 
pretty much on Instagram is like the easiest way to find me. Facebook is phasing out. Don't go there. Email's weird. That's really weird. Don't, don't email me unless it's a business request. <laughs> but otherwise, message me on Instagram for the most part. I, I answer. I have people asking me for advice all the time. I've never met them in person, but I just love connecting with people. The more that I help other people, the more other people help me. So the fact that I'm sharing my story and other people are coming out and saying, you're not alone. I'm like, sweet, I'm not alone. And those people are like, I'm not alone. Um, That's the best feeling. Awesome. And of course, if you want to contact us here at BJJ Mental Models, easiest way to do that is go to bjjmentalmodels.com. There's a contact form there, as well as a full database of all of the concepts we talk about here on the show. Um, A lot of the stuff that we talked about today, actually, I've got some pretty detailed write-ups there and references out to other information. So again, bjjmentalmodels.com. And of course, this podcast is just the tip of the iceberg of the services that we offer. It is the people on Patreon who subscribe. They are the ones who keep the lights on here. There's a ton of premium stuff there, especially if you're interested in really deep dives into things like game planning, the mechanics of jujitsu, of course, access to our awesome Discord community, which I highly recommend everyone get onto, and narrated feedback reviews. If you want to know directly from me how a lot of the concepts we talk about apply to your game, you can get on there. There are different tiers for everyone, depending on your level of price commitment and willingness. So again, patreon.com slash BJJ Mental Models. Please do give that a go. Patreon.com slash BJJ Mental Models. Look forward to having you guys check that out. And again, I mean, to tie this up, if there's one thing that I would love everyone to do as soon as they hit the stop button on this, I mean, other, of course, than support us on Patreon. The other (laughs) thing would be, I mean, give it a shot, right? Regardless of where you're at in terms of your mental health, regardless of whether you know you have issues, you think you might be battling issues, or you're actually feeling pretty good, like... Don't look at it as there's something wrong with me. Look at it as I want to improve every day in every way that I can. I want to have that Kaizen mindset. You know, even if you you feel like your mental health is A+, plus, just like in jiu-jitsu, right? There's no such thing as good enough. I'd say as soon as you stop this podcast, just Google, find a, a good rated therapist, mindset coach, psychiatrist, just give it a try, right? Like the, the cost to you is is relatively minimal and the benefits that you could get out of it are tremendous. So just like we constantly badger our friends to try jujitsu, I would say that Aaron and I are badgering you to just try getting help, see what happens, get a coach and just see exactly what can happen when you really invest in your mental game. So there's my pitch. Awesome. All right. Well, Aaron, thank you so much. I really do appreciate you coming by. Hope that once the pandemic is over, we can actually meet in person. That would be super fun. Definitely. I love Vancouver. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. Well, if you're ever up here, do let me know. And of course, same same to all of the listeners, man. By the time this, hopefully by the time this episode goes live, things are somewhat back to normal. Do shoot me a message. I'd love to hopefully connect with you guys. Thanks again for all the time and attention to everyone listening this week. And I'll talk to you guys next time.